Hello and welcome to this first lecture on the introduction to the physics of colloidal suspensions. In this, in the next few minutes, uh, what we'll be discussing will be mostly where are colloids found and what exactly they are. Um, without further ado, we'll just basically uh, start by simply asking where do we find colloids and why is it that it's in important and interesting to um, uh, to know about them. So the first case I want to mention is actually blood. Okay, blood is in fact a colloidal mixture, mixture, and there are um, some diseases which are related to how these colloids inside blood do interact with each other. For examples, now uh, there is a wide variety of um, uh, of cases that involve colloids. Uh, that are not related to blood, thankfully. Uh, one is photography, or at least old-style photography with photographic plates, which involved um, some uh, uh, silver oxide particles. Um, then, of course, uh, you can find them in opals, which are a very specific type of stones that are incredibly beautiful, as you can see here, with the many colors. Uh, and we'll see, actually, in the next lectures, why is it so. And uh, also, it involves anything that has to do with inks and paints. Uh, essentially, the particles, the dye particles that, con that basically make the color of these inks and paints uh, are colloidal particles. And, um, and also cosmetics for men and women alike. Now, also, food products are uh, ranging from, let's say, uh, milk to foams. So here, let's say, whipped. Um, uh, whipped uh, egg white uh, used in a dessert called uh, Floating Island, which I recommend by the way, it's a very good one. Um, and so you see it, it has ranges of, of products here. And finally, uh, it's used also in, let's say, the biomedical uh, realm where uh, it can be used for bacteria sites, for example, silver nanoparticles or silver uh, microparticles uh, are used in. Um, in water treatment, heavily used in fact, and also there are plenty of colloids involved in toothpaste, which make sure that your mouth is basically fresh and fine. Now, once we have done that, it could we could have actually gone on for quite a long time, like simply listing where colloids can be found. Uh, but the point I want to make is basically you can find them everywhere, okay? Uh, and that's the reason why they are important. Um, so, let's try to delve a bit more into the details of what colloids are. Uh, phenomenologically, colloids are microparticles of a foreign phase immersed in a dominant phase. Okay, what do I mean by that? So, if you consider milk, for example, then the foreign phase would be uh, fat, or basically big lump of fat, that are immersed in a dominant phase, which would be water. Um, and you can, of course, play this game with forms that would be air bubbles, that would be in a surrounding matrix of water, of liquid water, if you will. Um, so, uh, the point here is that to be a colloidal suspension, or for a particle to be a colloid, it needs to satisfy two properties. The first one is that the particles need to remain suspended in the solvent, and the second one is that they need to be moving around in the solvent if they are in dilute enough concentration. Now, to be more specific, the suspended aspect uh, of the colloid means that they do not sediment, okay? They do not accumulate either at the top of the, of the, of the your substance or at the bottom, if you will. Now, the move around part, what it means in fact, is that the motion of these colloids is dominated by random thermal motion, okay? And these two aspects will be important to characterize what, by, to characterize what we mean by colloids. And in fact, here are two examples of things that are not colloids. So for example, here you, you see a, a quite nice video of a strong magnet, okay, which is this uh, donut here, uh, which is levitating on top of a, uh, of an electromagnet. Now, uh, it it ticks a box of being suspended, okay, in the air, in fact. 
However, it does not move around due to the air, okay? Uh, and therefore, for that reason, it's not a colloid. Now, on the right hand side, you have here a video of sedimenting ashes. Um, and as you see, they seem to be kind of moving around as well a bit. That could be due to the initial stirring of the, of the water, or that could be due to uh, maybe a little bit of thermal motion. But at the end of the day, what you see is that they do suspend. I mean, they do, sorry, they do sediment at the very bottom of the bottle, and therefore they can't be considered as being colloids. Okay, so here we see that there is something related to the actual uh, scale, maybe, of these particles, like definitely the donut on the left-hand side and the ashes on the right-hand side can be seen with the naked eye, and maybe they are a bit too big to be colloidal. And this is what we'll try to determine a bit more quantitatively uh, in the next slides to come. So, what does it take to be a colloid? Uh, on Earth, an object in a fluid is subject to an effective weight. This effective weight basically uh, accounts for the actual weight of the object on Earth, okay, which is pulling it uh, towards the ground, and the buoyancy uh, effect of the surrounding fluid in which the particle is immersed. Um, and that's the reason why in the expression on the left there is this uh, effective weight, the MEF correspond to an effective mass which accounts for the uh, solvent being displaced which is then um, um, inducing uh, a buoyancy uh, reaction, a buoyancy force. To be more specific, WEFF is the effective weight, okay, accounting for this effect. G would be here is the acceleration on Earth, about 9.8 meters per second squared. Then D here is the diameter of the object, so pi over 6 times D cubed is nothing but the volume of a sphere um, in 3D. And then rho would be the mass density of the object. Rho solvent here would be the mass density of the solvent. Now, we are not interested really in the force aspect of it. What we want to know is to work with the energy aspect of it. Now, because this is an effective weight, we know that weight is actually a conservative force for which we can define uh, potential energy, which is like so, if I express it in terms of the diameter and the mass density. Now, what I want to explain is that if I want to uh, basically uh, combine this aspect of the sedimentation, which is that there is a potential energy associated to it, and the particle will be driven towards the minimum potential energy uh, areas, then I need to, to basically combine this with the concept of thermal fluctuations. Now, the typical energy of, a, uh, of thermal fluctuations, or of a kick coming from, let's say, a water molecule, would be about KBT, where KB is the Boltzmann constant and T is the actual uh, absolute temperature expressed in Kelvin. Um, if you were to imagine, uh, on the right-hand side here, a colloidal particle at some altitude above uh, the, the ground or the sedimentation point, um, and then you, at some point, imagine that there is a kick, a KBT, that is being given to the particle. And you want to know, with this extra energy, how high can this particle go inside this fluid? Well, if you want to figure that out, then the uh, height difference would be delta Z, and you just need to plug that into the uh, equation we had on the, on the previous slide, and you would get, basically, this particular equation. Okay, nothing really uh, incredible there. And then by reshuffling the terms, you can get that delta Z in absolute value would be equal to uh, this equation uh, over here at the bottom. Um, now, once this is uh, determined, then we can try to figure out, um, based on what we want, which is something suspended that does not sediment, what it is that we can say. Well, there are two options here. If delta z, so the typical uh, distance that can be, or the typical displacement owing to a thermal 
uh, kick, if you will, uh, if this typical displacement is smaller or much smaller than the diameter of the particle, then basically the particle sediment and then doesn't move from where it is. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if the um, uh, displacement owing to uh, thermal motion uh, is actually much bigger or bigger than the diameter, then what it tells you is that the particle can at least move past its own diameter even if it has sedimented. And therefore, uh, this is uh, what we'll say to be uh, the ability to overcome sedimentation. At least, you know, the boundary, like the minimum ability to overcome sedimentation. So once we have put that, we can just simply plug the equation we had found before into this. So this is what you obtain in the first equation here. And then you end up with the, when reshuffling the term, you end up with this particular equation, which is that the diameter of a particle should be less than uh, the suspension diameter, if you will, uh, which involves the uh, fourth root of kBT here and 1 over g, for example. Uh, so this is basically uh, an upper bound for the uh, size that a particle must have in order to, uh, to be suspended due to thermal motion. Now, is that enough? Well, it turns out that although people don't say it often, um, it turns out that in practice, we do assume that, that, we do assume that colloids are actually classical particles or that they behave classically. Uh, and behave classically in the sense that they, are to, they do not have any quantum uh, behavior. Now, how do we account for that? Well, one way to say that is basically to invoke the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, which says that delta x times delta p has to be bigger than h. Okay? In case you don't remember, delta x here is the uncertainty in position, Delta P is uncertainty in momentum, and H is a Planck constant. Now, what we want to know is basically what is the typical delta X, which is the, the uh, spread uh, the, uh, in space of the wave function, uh, given, a, uh, given uh, a delta P. As we have seen before, if there is thermal motion involved, we can determine what is the typical uncertainty in momentum. Now, it turns out that the contribution due to thermal motion goes as the square root of m times kBT, where m is the actual mass of the particle. And this comes simply from the uh, equipartition theorem that tells you that the typical, that the average kinetic energy of a particle is half times kBT, at least in one direction. Now, if you simply replace m by volume of the particle, which is pi over 6 divided by, uh, multiplied by d cubed, and then times the mass density, you get the equation on the right-hand side. Now, once this is done, you can determine then what is delta x, and you, you know that delta x then is bigger than h divided by the square root of pi divided by 6 times d cubed times rho times kBT. Now the next step, and the last one in fact, consists in, in determining what does it mean to be classical. And what it means for a particle to be classical, at least that's what we'll imagine, is that the typical spread of the wave function in space has to be much smaller than the, than the diameter of the particle. And so if it's much smaller, therefore there is no quantum uncertainty, if you will, about where is the particle. It is basically at a definite position with respect to its actual size. And so the way we put that quantitatively is that delta x has to be smaller than, let's say, a tenth of its radius. And if you ask this and replace in the equation above, you end up with having that the diameter of a colloidal particle has to be uh, above uh, or bigger than the quantum diameter, uh, which is which involves the fifth uh, root of one over kBT and the fifth root of h squared.
Okay, you don't need to remember, by the way, these two equations. Okay, they are uh, they depend on how we phrase things. There are many ways to uh, to get to the same result. However, it's good to remember what it is that we want to uh, ensure. So the first I, re I remind you is basically suspension due to thermal motion, and the second thing is that we don't want the particle to be uh, behaving like a quantum, uh, you know, uh, wave. Uh, so we can put all of this together into a single plot where we plot the actual diameter as a function of the uh, temperature in Kelvin. So you see here on, in red you have the D suspension. Okay, anything above this red line would be the particles that are sedimenting on Earth and for a solvent uh, close to water and density of the particle as well. And then anything below the blue curve would be in the quantum regime. And in between the two, you've got the magical realm that will be interesting in, which is that of colloidal scale, which is, and that's a standard uh, scale in fact, w between one nanometer in size and one micron. Okay, so this is the typical scale we'll be dealing with when we talk about colloidal particles in the next lectures to come. Before finishing this lecture, what I will just hint to is basically how do particles interact, how do colloidal particles interact in fact, and um, because these particles are immersed in a solvent, it's very often the case that they are they acquire a charge in being put in solution. Uh, in these cases, there, are, there has been a theory uh, that has been proposed like decades ago by Deryagin, Landau, Verve, and Overbeck, and for short, it's called the DLVO theory, which proposes that there are only two interactions at play if you're interested in how these two particles, these two colloids basically interact. Uh, the first of this interaction is the colloid-colloid van der Waals interaction in solution. And what this means, and we'll see that more in details later, is that it's owing to charge fluctuations in neutral objects. The second interaction is a colloid-colloid electrostatic interaction in solution. And this is owing to the colloid's net charges acquired in solution. Now, what you see is that these two interactions, in fact, are both of electrodynamic uh, nature. It's just that it is convenient to split them into one contribution coming from a neutral object and another contribution coming from pure electrostatic of, let's say, Coulomb-like objects that have a net non-zero charge. So in the next lecture, we'll actually look at or remind basically ourselves uh, how do neutral objects even interact with each other um, and then we'll move on from there.